Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 51, Join the Club, where we talk about building your own local tabletop gaming club. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here tonight, late on Twitch. We start here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more off the books after show. That's correct. It's 9.30 p.m. Eastern, despite what I might post on Twitter half an hour before the show starts, or two hours before the show starts. Now, for those of you who aren't here live, you can listen in on that after show audio, as well as audio from our front desk, the pre-show banter that you don't get to hear because we don't start recording until you hear that bell. As a thanks for supporting us, you also get other cool stuff like access to our private Discord channel where you can chat with us and other fans of the show, pre-production show notes, behind the scene blog posts, and more. Now, tonight, I am tossing out a bunch of tips for launching a tabletop gaming club. Now, at the tail end of the show, I've also got a bunch of games for our Tabletop Gaming Weekly segment, uh, which includes ones I think people are going to be interested in, which are my first plays of Talisman Legendary Tales and Dead Man's Cabal. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, whether that's positive or negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, first up, I've got yet another comment on our ridiculously popular Gloomhaven FAQ video on YouTube. Chisel78 writes, Seeing as this game was basically designed and managed by one person, it's a miracle the FAQ is the length it is, and the balance so well done. A miracle. I don't get the complaining. Great vid, though, just sticking up for Isaac. Well, and that's certainly a fair point, Trizzy. And despite all the complaining, we really do enjoy the game. While I feel some of the problems, especially those that have existed over several revisions, are less forgivable, one of my biggest problems, regardless of how many people work on something, is clarity. And I stand by my thoughts on how some of the cards read. Even in the digital version, I'm still bothered by some of the text formatting. Uh, now, next up on the set of comments, based on a YouTube video, our Horizons unboxing video. Keith Davies writes... It was fun watching you unpack this one. I was identifying each of the components to myself as you went. I figure you've probably read the rules by now, so I didn't write to explain. I got my copy of Horizons months ago. It's another winner of a game. I've really enjoyed playing it. A bit heavier than Valeria Card Kingdoms, but nowhere near overwhelming. Well, thanks for the comment, Keith. Uh, as you correctly guessed, I have indeed not only read the rules, but played Horizon a few times at this point. I've really been enjoying it, though I gotta say, I don't think it's really heavier than Valeria. I would say it's about the same, if not just a bit lighter. Now, I do know that Keith plays a lot of Valeria how, based on how often he brings it up, because anytime I mention Daily Magic, he mentions Valeria or something about Valeria or their new Kickstarter, Margraves of Valeria. Uh, he's a bit of a Valeria fanboy, and I just think you probably played Card Kingdom so much that you've internalized a lot of it. I gotta say, as a new gamer, it's not the easiest game, and Horizons to me seems a little bit more approachable. Now, I will say I am digging it so far, though I gotta say I much more enjoyed the three-player game than the two-player game I played. Now, what I really want to do is try it with five, but I haven't gotten there yet. Hopefully that'll happen sometime soon. Uh, that's pretty much it for comments this week. I'll, I'll admit it's a little slower than usual, but really our last episode was a con wrap-up, so I wasn't expecting a lot of feedback on a con wrap-up episode either way. Just before we move on, I want to thank everyone who comments, emails, replies, and engages with our content wherever you find it. Cheers. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. Don't forget, 
If you're here live, we continue the show after the double bell in an off-the-books after show, as well as some special features that sometimes make it onto YouTube. Uh, not too much happening going on just yet. Now, I want to check with you before I bring this up. Are we talking about the spiel this week, or are we going to bring it up another week? What the spiel? The, the, the winners. I didn't even know it had been announced. Yes, the winners are out. Yeah, um, that'll be next week. Okay. I don't, I don't know where we'll fit it in, but we'll talk about the winners next week. I don't, I don't think I want to do a spiel recap episode, but we could add a segment maybe. Okay. Maybe I'll, what I'll do is I'll try to pick a shorter topic. Cause the other thing is I am today finished up the review of Gokuku, which everyone's already basically heard, but I do want to throw it in the show as an official review segment. At some point, I just got to throw things in. Um, the Ennies are out too. The Ennie voting just closed like yesterday or the day before. We could do a 2019 gaming. Yeah. I, it's somewhere in there. Yeah. We should at least mention it somewhere. If not, a, it, unless it's just an after show topic. But I'm thinking we can fit in. If I if I got a go Kuka review, if I can find a topic that's like one of the quick ones, which we get a few of those now and then that I haven't answered because I'm, it's usually not enough for a full show. Maybe I'll find something we can answer. Like Ryan's question he's asked forever ago where we're trying to find a two-player only co-op game. I still have not yet to find him his game because the only one I know of is And Then We Held Hands, which just doesn't work for him. Now getting to today's topic, though, we're going to be talking all about launching a game club and trying to build the local gaming community. What I would love to hear from the chat are things you have done to help build your local community. This doesn't have to be founding a club, but I do know at least one person in the chat that's rather involved in a local gaming convention. We'll be back stopping by the lobby a few more times later in the show. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop one, Bellhop, one word. Well, the best place is for questions come through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. This week, we're taking a break from specific game recommendations and talking about building a local gaming community. Rob Bush writes... Do you have any tips on starting an organized gaming club? Ideally, one that's self-sustaining enough to build up a club-owned gaming library. Well, thanks so much for the great question, Rob. Now, my biggest tip for starting up any type of organized gaming club or local community, really building any sort of game group, is to do it. Just start something right away. Don't try to plan out this big Thing. One of the things in Rob's question kind of hit me right away is you seem to already have the goal of building a game gaming library. Start smaller than that. Just get going, get people together and get them gaming. It doesn't have to be perfect. Start small and there'll be problems, but you can address those along the way. Don't build out this big roadmap. Just get a group together. Get people to the Tim Hortons, get people to the local coffee shop, get people together. Your group will grow. And then as it grows, then you can adapt and change things along the way. Now, while you do need to dig in and just do it, that doesn't mean there aren't some steps you shouldn't take in advance, though. A bit of planning can go a long way. Yeah, you, you're not, but you're not going to be able to plan everything ahead of time, right? You're not going to have the best game library. You may not have much of a game library at all. You may not get a lot of people at first, but you got to start somewhere. And my recommendation is the same thing we heard at all the panels that we're talking about developing board games is fail faster, right? In a way that applies here. Just get it going. Don't sit on your butt too long. Now, find somewhere to play. Get the word out about the event through social media. Show up, be a good host and play some games. Don't worry about numbers. Just worry about having fun with the people who do show up. Then come the week after, look back on it, see what you've learned and do something small to improve things for the next event. Eventually, over just small improvements and iterations over time, you should have yourself a gaming club. Along with that, not only a probably growing gaming collection, but more importantly to me, a thriving local gaming community. Now for basics, that's really all a club is, people in a community. Uh, the people will change and the places will shift. The games themselves will shift. But as long as people are getting together and doing things together, you've got a club. Mm -hmm. uh, now, with that said, let's get into some specific tips and suggestions to get you started. First off, finding a place to play. A gaming space for your new game club. 
Yeah, one of the things you're going to need to do is find a place to gather your group of gamers together, a place to play. Now, this could be someone's house. I personally recommend against this because I got to say, you never know who's going to show up to any publicly advertised event. Well, you can certainly get things started with your own personal gaming group, and that works at home. That's not really a club. That's what you're doing already. Opening yourself up to the public is really that first step. Yeah, and when you're just starting out, you could probably play in any public area that's got two, three, three or more tables available. This could be a local coffee shop, a cafe, a restaurant. Uh, local libraries may be willing to host a game night. Now, I know one local game group that actually lives in an apartment building that has a common room, and they are able to get that on Saturdays, which works well for them. Now, personally, I'm not a huge fan of the apartment building. I prefer something very public because when I'm starting a club like this, one of the things I want to do is to attract new gamers. I don't want to just get the local gamers I already know in a new gaming space. I want to attract strangers, and I can't really attract strangers unless I'm somewhere public where they can see us gaming. Now, the important thing here, though, if you do decide on a venue, is talk to that venue. Actually ask if they're cool with having a bunch of gamers take over their place for an afternoon or a weekend or whatever timing you're going for. Don't just assume that if you walk into a place and go, oh, there's lots of open tables here, that they're going to be perfectly cool with a bunch of people taking up those tables playing games. So we've done a lot of talk about this sort of interaction. So if you check out episode 12, you'll find some tips about engaging with businesses, uh, cafes and restaurants for gaming. Now, when you are just starting out in this community building adventure, I do caution against having your event at venues that serve alcohol or that are specifically bars or pubs. Now, while I do love a good beer and pretzel game night and I will imbibe some beers while playing, until you've established a core group who know each other well and you're comfortable running public events and hosting, I strongly recommend staying away from the complications alcohol can add to a game night. Now, once you're an old pro and you've got a group of gamers around you that you already know well and trust, then sure, run an adult-themed game night that includes whatever beverages you want. Don't forget that alcohol can also limit your attendance. Families and those not comfortable around drinking may avoid your events, and you could lose out on some great players early on if you decide you're limited to a certain type of event and person. Once you get branded or labeled a certain way by mm -hmm. people, it can be really hard to shake. Yeah, in my opinion, you're better off starting off with a family-friendly, family-oriented game night. And if you want to have that adult game night, make that like a special event. Like instead of our normal meeting, we're all going to meet at this pub and have an adult-only game night. And we're going to play Munchkin and Flux and just have some fun. But stick to the core club mechanic being open to everyone. Now, one of the things you can do is check with your local game stores. For one, they may already have something like you're looking to do already going. They may have some kind of club. If they don't have some kind of club, there is a good chance they have a local game night. And if they don't, I actually encourage you to work with them and offer to host one yourself. Because most stores are happy to oblige if someone else is willing to take on the hosting and promotion. Like I now run a lot of my events at game stores and I work with them to do things like feature specific games or to get certain games in the store. And even recently, I've got a designer coming down from Ottawa to show off his new game at the game store. Now, that's something the game store didn't do on their own. We work together to get this going. Now, the stores in turn, hopefully do things like host giveaways or have promos or do some things to help promote the night and get attendance up on their side, which in general, for your club and for the store, it should be a win-win situation. Yeah. Now check out episode 32, which is our episode on <laughs> friendly uh, local game stores to find out a lot more about your friendly local game stores and how to work with them and, and what makes them friendly. Now, the one thing, though, is there can be problems with game stores. You don't necessarily want to do all of your event at game stores. You may want to avoid them entirely because of this. Some people, first off, just don't like playing in a retail space. Uh, whether that's a feeling of obligation to buy something. Um, there's also a stigma attached to game stores and the people who shop at game stores. And some people are uncomfortable. There is also a not even a stigma, but um, a false perception. A lot of parents think that game stores are a certain way that they necessarily aren't. Then there's the whole problem of local gamer politics, uh, especially if your area has more than one store. Gamers tend to have loyalty towards their favorite store and often won't support another one. Uh, 
This is why overall, personally, I prefer to host any gaming events at a neutral public venue if I can find one. This can be a tough part of any gaming club. Uh, if you live in a small town and you only have one gaming store, great. But if you're trying to build a citywide community in a place where there are multiple gaming stores or multiple stores that sell gaming products, uh, and especially if there is a rivalry between these stores, even things that you see as innocuous can be taken the wrong way. Uh, sticking to neutral venues that aren't directly related to games and specifically selling games can really avoid much of that and stop from hurting anyone's feelings or getting any, anyone upset. Uh, even if it means giving up on some of the benefits that we have mentioned earlier of playing at a gaming store. Yeah, if you can, wherever possible, try to stay neutral yourself. If you have a club, try to make it a neutral club not associated with a particular retail entity. Now, some other things to watch for. Make sure the venue is well lit, has big enough tables for the types of games you plan on playing, and it isn't too loud. A big tip that you may not think of, depending on the city you're in and your own transportation ability, is trying to pick a venue that's reachable via public transit, whether that's a bus or subway route, whatever you have in your city. Because I have found out that a lot of gamers, especially if you're aiming for a younger crowd or students, don't necessarily have their own transportation. So being on a bus route can hugely boost your numbers. For those that do drive, do find out the parking situation and communicate that to anyone who may be attending. There are a events locally that people are lightly attended because there's literally nowhere to park so it's one of the things that when you're picking your venue you should be watching for and something to communicate to the people who are prospective gamers coming out another item is the area around the venue if you're asking people to come to an event evening of gaming are they going to feel safe leaving afterwards mm -hmm. if the answer might be no have solutions available even if it's just organizing groups to walk out together and you know help keep an eye out on on other people uh it's it's, actually, it's a, there's a lot of gaming stores that are unable to afford better rents and end up being in somewhat less desirable parts of town sometimes that's a really good point actually just to add to that here in windsor i tried running events downtown at the um coffee exchange not the coffee exchange Coffee exchange, we did do gaming. The Green Bean downtown, and we had people who would not come out because they were scared to go downtown Windsor on a Friday night. And the thing is, downtown Windsor on a Friday night is filled with loud, drunk 19 and 20 year olds, mostly from the US because they can drink here and they can't drink, drink there. And I get it. Like, there's this is a valid, valid fear. I'll put it that way. We weren't expecting too much. The, the yes. scar on my face from a beer bottle broken over my head by a drunk Friday night. Reveler yes. in downtown Windsor. So, so we actually lost um, membership. Like we had people, we used to do it at a green bean that was near the University of Windsor, had great attendance, moved it downtown to the new location and our attendance dropped. And at first I didn't get it because I'm a big adult male and I take up a lot of space and people don't mess with me. I am not a target, but I get that some of the people coming out thought they might be. And it's definitely something to consider that I hadn't even thought of. So definitely something to consider. Now, once you do have a spot, this is important. Trust me. Support the venue. Make it worth the venue's time and having you, having you and your group there. Encourage people to support the venue in any way that fits, any way they can. Now, this could be buying food. This could be buying drinks. This could be shopping at the store. Um, if you have any service being provided, make sure you tip well. Even more importantly, in my opinion, is respect the establishment. Clean up after yourselves. Don't make a mess. If you're rearranging tables, put them back where they came from. Make sure you leave the place in better condition than you came when you came in. Yeah, the more you respect the venue, the more they'll respect you. It goes both ways. And my experience is that a venue that is treated well will go over and above for regular groups. Uh, yes. And Angie Games points out in the in the chat room. We've talked about this on other episodes. But if you're going to a restaurant, so somewhere that serves food or beverages, don't bring in external yes. food and beverages. Just don't. I, I, you know, just don't. Yeah, pretty much. Like if if you absolutely must, like if you you shouldn't must. I can't think of a good no. reason why you couldn't just eat before you come. Yeah. Ask. Right. Some places are cool with it. So as an example, one of the local stores is half sandwich shop. You can bring outside food to the game store half. 
You cannot to the food store half. And this isn't just they don't want you to eat and they want you to support them, but it's a health risk. You are bringing in outside food and they don't know what kind of contaminants could get mixed in with their food. So I like if you absolutely feel you must ask, but like really, if you can't go four or five hours without eating, maybe you shouldn't, you know, I don't know. I, I, I can't think yeah. of a polite way to say it. Yeah. So next up, building a game library for your gaming club. So this is getting right back to the question, right? Obviously, um, Rob was very interested in making a sustaining club that could build a game library. Um, so when you first start your new gaming club, you're, it's going to probably be up to you to bring all the games. Like if you're the one taking the initiative to start the club, you probably already have a game collection. You're probably already a gamer. You probably already have a group or your group just moved away. You're looking for a new group. I, I just assume that you're probably already that alpha gamer type, right? If you're thinking of even taking that step to start a club, if you're lucky, you're also going to know some other local gamers who have games and you're going to have to tap that resource. The other thing though, is make sure you let people know they can bring their own games. I personally don't expect to show up at game night and have a million games available. I don't expect the Toronto Area Board Game Society level of games. I expect a few people to have a few games there that they're interested in teaching and interested in having. Plus, I'm always going to show up with my own. I think it's like the... I can't see it... I can't think of how to word this. All right, we'll just cut that because... <laughs> Well, and if you've got games coming in from multiple sources, you might want to plan for some solutions to prevent any confusion, mm. even if it's just as simple as having a pen and some sticky notes available so that you can label a couple of, you know, if some two people bring the same game, you can throw a label, a sticky note on one, not damage anything and just keep things separate. You want to make sure that you're available, you're, you're aware and can uh, handle things like that. Yeah, very true. Or just toss a, a business card or a card with your name inside the box something I probably should do more. I'm overly trusting. Uh, what I try to do at my gaming area is I have everyone, I try to find a table and I have people put their games on their tables and they just kind of group their games. So it's like, you know, and then people can borrow them. But then what I find is when people borrow them, they don't put them back in the same pile. So yeah, totally legit. Something we should do better actually. Now, one of the advantages of playing at a local game store is that many most all good local game stores are going to have demo copies and games on hand. Now, some local libraries also have a growing, a growing number of local libraries have game board game libraries. And while there's the gaming cafes that are popping up all over the place, and those often also have a selection game on hands. Now, the problem is the quality of those games may not match what you want to play. Uh, for example, there is a local bar called Parks and Rec, which I went to and I was staggered by their collection of probably three to 500 games, all of which look like they were built, bought at a reach sales store, a value village. Like there were more copies of Trivial Pursuit than I've ever seen. And I'm not sure why they would have the Star Trek VHS game at a bar without a VHS player. Like, I, I, I don't know where they got their games. But check with the venue because they may have games. You may not need to bring your own. Well, if the library is collecting games, uh, <clears throat> so perhaps mass market focused, uh, perhaps reach out to your library and talk to whoever does their purchasing or at the local game cafe or wherever you're finding this there and talk to them and sit down for a discussion about gaming. They may not be aware of the mm. market that's out there. Uh, for a lot of people, you know, you've grown up with Monopoly and that's what gaming is. Yeah. Uh, so do your own step to help inform this location, then they may be willing to uh, help uh, broaden their scope. Very true. Now, one way to grow your library, though, is to approach those local stores and see if they're willing to lend, rent in some way, or donate games for your club game nights. Now, the thing is, when asking for this, don't just be like, hey, give me games. Point out that the store can gain something from this. Have the store include business cards in every game they provide or put a sticker on it or something that says, hey, this game was donated by a friendly local game store. So that when people are playing the games, they can be like, oh, that's cool. Local game store donated this game. Uh, just make sure you note. And the other thing is note your events sponsored by them. If you have a store that provides games and you're going to put out media, right, whether that's online, social media or banners or whatever you're going to do, include the store's name on there. Say, hey, games provided by it. Give them credit. 
which gives them advertising, which gives them a reason to give you those games. Besides the added fact of you're probably going to bring more gamers into local community, which is good for all the local game stores. Yeah. And and don't just drop a business card in there if you're looking to, to actually promote them. Glue it, staple it, secure it to that game box. Again, if you're building a gaming library, you're not necessarily worried about your resale value the same way you are with a personal library. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea of gluing something to the box or putting a big sticker on it shouldn't be as horrifying to you as it is for your own personal games, which I completely understand you not yeah. wanting to do. Um, you know, make sure make sure that the 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 business that is doing the donating is seeing a reward from their donations. If yes. they aren't seeing any increase in business or people saying, "Hey, I decided to come in here because I saw you had donated a game to blah blah blah," they aren't going to continue doing that. Mm -hmm. So the more you can help that store see a benefit, the more you'll get from them in the long run. Very true. Now, another source of games for public play is directly through publishers, designers, and um, direct marketing, right? Direct marketing sales. Because many companies are really happy to provide you with demo copies of their, your games, their games, as long as you're teaching and showing off those games at public events. Now, most of these companies are going to want some kind of information before you start, like where you're playing, how many people are going to be there, how often you've had events. Um, I've had them often ask for pictures after, uh, I think one, so they can promote it, but two, just to prove that you're actually doing it. Um, due to this, you may not want to do this right away. You might want to do it once you've built up a solid membership base and have had a bunch of nights under your, your belt. But it can often be worth both your wilds again, because you're going to showcase their games and especially teaching. If you're willing to teach people their game, they're pretty happy to give you a copy to teach with because that's just going to sell the game. Because the way people sell games is they play games and enjoy them and go buy copies. Um, a lot in, unfortunately for us in Canada, this is few and far between. Not many companies do this in Canada, but there are specific systems set up by different companies i think strongholds games is called the envoy system and other publishers have their own system specifically for people who run clubs and will showcase their games now and this shouldn't be need to, need to be said but do not lie uh don't inflate your numbers in search of more free stuff or to pad your own game collection for uh a company will likely only be sending out a certain number of copies mm -hmm. and you are literally taking these copies away from somebody else by doing that. Uh, and probably a more deserving group if uh, you're needing to, you know, inflate your numbers. Now, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but you also want to source the local community for games. Uh, if you are really building a game library that's for the club to use, not just trying to build your own gaming collection, you should try be able to find local gamers who are willing to either lend or donate games to that library. Now, I admit this works really well if the library can have a central location, because one of the problems with you having the game library, and this is something we have a problem with here in Windsor, is what if I'm not there, right? What if the, the game club owner, the organizer isn't there, so they can't bring their collection? It'd be really great if there was a central location. Now, I don't know exactly where it is, but I know like the Toronto Area Board Game Society, Tabs, has a centrally located board game, uh, word, board game collection. That's not what I was looking for, but that's fine. Uh, a, a set of their, their game library. They have that in any tabs event, that library is available. I'm sure there's some kind of management in the back on who brings the library and where it gets stored. But that's a great way to get local gamers like, hey, donate your games to our library or buy them cheap or whatever you have to do, some kind of deal. But there's lots of local gamers who probably have games that are collecting dust on their shelves that may fit great into your game library. Yeah. So for me, this is vital. Where the library is stored can be a complete deal breaker. Again, we get into politics. Uh, if it's at a store, why is it that store and not another store? If it's at somebody's home, why do they get to have all these awesome games to play anytime they want uh, with their friends? Uh, again, there is probably no solution to this, but a neutral venue like a cafe or an actual library may be your best bet. Now, I will personally admit that as person who organizes the events and the person who made the contact with the companies, my feeling is that's as the person who I wouldn't say owns the Windsor Gaming Resource Library because we don't really have a Windsor Gaming Resource Library, but I'm the one that 
reached out to the companies, got the game, so I'm the one that holds on to them. And if anyone wants to play them, they just have to let me know when I bring them out. I admit it's not the best solution, but we don't have a central location or an impartial place to store this stuff. That one thing to note, we're talking about these big board game libraries. You don't need it. You don't need a massive board game library to have a fun game night. For public play, you just need a few of the classics, some gateway games everyone can enjoy, and then some stuff you're personally excited about. Because one of the things is having too many options to pick from can sometimes hinder a game night, as no one can agree on what to play. And which leads us into the next topic. What games should you have present at a public tabletop game night? Now, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, as this is something we've definitely discussed many times on the show before. Many of our episodes are game night, uh, game night, or game recommendations, specific game recommendations. But in general, you want a mix of tried and true gateway games, uh, games that will attract a variety of players, and you're going to want some modern hobby games that you think attendees will dig and be excited about. Now, specific episodes, we mentioned this uh, one just recently, we recorded episode 48, just a couple episodes ago, where we talked about casual games for four to six players. Pretty much everything on that list is going to be perfect for a public gaming night or a public game club. Uh, if you go back to episode 38, we talk about next step games from Catan. So we talk about some gateway games and then some next step games. And then way back to episode 28, we talk about the hook, which is great games for hooking new gamers. Pretty much all of those are going to be good episodes to get you started uh, for what you should look for for a game club's game library. Uh, I would double down on episode 28 for a new club to help it expand. Those intro games are a great to have as a base yeah. to build from. Now, as for actual numbers of games to bring, I admit I don't bring a lot. I tend to bring two or three gateway games or party games, as well as one or two heavier games that I personally really want to play. Again, you don't want to bring too much because if you have too many games, people spend too long trying to decide what to play instead of actually playing. Now, how many people you expect will also have an impact yeah. on this. If 30 people show up, you could be struggling to find space at Games for Everyone if no one else is bringing games as well. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a vital part about planning what to bring, though. Plan ahead. Um, as like your first event, you're not going to know better. But once you've got people out, you start to know the tastes of the local community. But also as part of setting up your event, let people know what games you know will be there. Plus, ask people if there's anything they want to play. Then you can work with other people in the community to see if you can get your hands on those games for the game night. Like for any event, you should always be sourcing your local community. It shouldn't be just you doing all the work. You shouldn't be the only one providing games, and you shouldn't be the only one teaching games, and you shouldn't be the only one doing the work. Yeah. This goes for having a game library, too. Unless you're playing at the location that hosts your game library, you don't want to be bringing the whole thing to every event. Uh, and if you're using a library, that may not even be possible, as you may have to sign them out, and libraries generally have limits on you know how much one person can sign out. Mm -hmm. Now, another trick I've learned for helping decide what games to bring is to pick a theme for your game night. So this is just to narrow it down so that you're not picking from the 9,000 games that have come out in the last year or even your 100 games in your game library or 30 games in your game library. So I've hosted superhero game nights, fantasy game nights. Uh, we've had pirate game nights. Uh, not only does this give people some direction on what games to bring and what to expect, but it also turns the game night into more of an event, more of a something special, a celebration. Uh, we've even encouraged people to dress up and cosplay for the right theme. Uh, take a look at our Ghastly Game Nights episode number 14 for thoughts on one specific theme concept, but also all the different aspects that can make up theme gaming. So that's one. He's pulling one out I totally forgot about. <laughs> now, one last consideration when picking games is make sure you pick games that you know. You know how to play them and you can teach them at least somewhat or at least games where you know someone else who can do this for you. Which leads us to the fact that for any public gaming event, you need people who can teach games. Yeah. Now, one of the things you need to do to make your gaming events successful is make them accessible. You want to appeal to a wide variety of people, and part of that is being willing to accept new gamers into the group. People with little or no gaming experience. In order to get these people out and have fun, you're going to need someone who's good at teaching games. Now, this could be you or someone else in the community. 
Even better, it can be multiple people in the community all looking to share their love of the hobby and all being willing to teach the games they bring to the table. And I got to say, Windsor has been fantastic for that. We always get people out excited about the games they bring and willing to teach other people. To work on your own learning, check out episode 30 to make the best of your own learning so that you can then teach others. Yeah, teaching games is a topic we've covered many times on the show. Um, again, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna. We're gonna refer you back to some of our previous podcasts. Uh, like if you go all the way back to episode five, Sean and I probably sound lousy, and the video quality is probably bad. But it's one of our best discussions, and it's a discussion on how I like to teach games, which includes a bunch of tips I've learned over the years, including talking about the way people learn and the way to present information. Once you've got that one down, check out episode 23, where we talk about the difference between teaching new gamers and experienced gamers. And do remember that knowing how to play a game is not the same as knowing how to teach it. Some yeah. people's, people who may be experts at playing a game may have never even picked up the rule book, which can, making, which can make teaching new players a little tricky. Yeah, and remember, there is no new parking rule in Monopoly. <laughs> Now, the important part here is that you have to make sure you have someone, hopefully multiple people present that are willing to teach games. Now, to help with that, I do have one pro tip. The one thing that can greatly help with teaching games is including rule summaries in the boxes for the games, whether these come from Board Game Geek or Esoteric Order of Gamers. Uh, I try to include these in the boxes of any games I'm bringing to public events. Now, some of these are so good, you don't even need a game teacher that people, strangers, can pick up the game and learn it from these sheets. Now, I'll second that, but I also add that a really great game library, and, I've, and I'm learning this from tabs uh, specifically, yeah. should have component storage. Now, there's no need to go out and spend money on custom inserts. You're not going to buy the Gloomhaven box insert for, you know, mm. $150. But make sure that you've got everything separate in baggies or Tupperware or some solution that will help get the game to the table faster and then encourage people to put it neatly away again afterwards. Uh, if you check episode 17, we've talked about accessories and we do mention uh, some things that can help in this matter as well. Yeah, and here's something as a tip that I still haven't taken advantage of. The way I, uh, I'm not practicing what I peach, preach here, but label them. Like if you have baggies, label what goes in each baggie. That really helps clean up. It's one of those things I'm like, I need spare time to sit downstairs and go through all my games and do, and I just never actually get around to doing it. But when you first bag the game, it's probably a good time to do it. But if you label it, like you have all your Tupperware containers, whatever you have, if it says Blue Meeple, everyone's going to know the Blue Meeple go in that container, and that'll really speed things up. Yeah. Now next, once you've got a place and some games, is getting people to actually come out to your tabletop gaming event. Yeah, nowadays, though, this isn't so hard. It is now easier than ever to get the word out about your gaming event. Social media is huge. Everyone's on it. Uh, you're currently watching us on Twitch or listening to us on a podcast. Like, these things didn't exist years ago. Nowadays, this is the main way people learn about new things is through the Internet, whether that's Twitter, or Facebook, or anything like else. And local gaming events are no exception to this. Like, honestly, one of the first things I think you should do if you have a new club and you're trying to build a local club is create a Facebook group for that club and create an event page on Facebook for every game night. I also recommend making a Twitter account, make an Instagram account where you can share pictures of your game nights and whatever new social media the kids are using nowadays, create an account there too. Yeah. Again, those are far from the only digital options out there and you probably know your community and what is being used better than we possibly could. Maybe it's meetup.com that's more active in your area mm -hmm. or WhatsApp groups or Discord even. There are so many options and who you'll reach is going to vary widely by what methods you use and where you are. Yeah, and one of the things that you got to do though is once you make these accounts, go back to them, keep them active. Now, if you make like 20 different accounts and you find that like 18 of them, no one's actually interacting with, okay, fine, let them go. You may not reach the right target market, but don't just jump into your group once a month and post your latest event. You want to share pictures at the events as they're happening, if possible, or at least afterwards. You want to encourage discussions between game nights about the games that were played or what we're going to play next. Do things like start a Twitter poll on what, how, who should have won the last match or what version of 
this game is better than that game or talk about if you liked AD and D better than OD and D, whatever that happens to be. Because one of the things social media can do is it can extend the club to be more than just game night. It becomes more of a community that way. And once you have a community, this becomes the key to the part of the question about self-sustaining. You cannot have a self-sustaining community if you are the only one active and everyone else is just showing up and following along. Mm -hmm. You need other people volunteering to teach and bring games to host events, organize. And when that happens and the workload becomes spread evenly, then you don't have to worry about the organ entire organization collapsing if one person has to step away. Yeah. And while we mentioned social media, uh, you should also be going analog. Like work with any local game stores to help promote your event, put up flyers, post on their community boards, local comic stores, hobby stores. Uh, most gamers are into other geeky things. So if you get a Spencer's gifts in your area, local library schools, popular coffee shops, pubs are all great places to promote your event. As long, and if your events are at a local store, cafe or restaurant, encourage them to promote it as well. Most of these places have their own social media accounts now, and if you're going to support them, ask them to support you back by promoting your event themselves and reaching their customer base. And again, just like when you're at the restaurant, be respectful about these resources. Don't make signs that are too big or post too many at once. If you're holding an event at a game store, be aware that the other game store may not want to drive traffic to a competitor. Yeah, and always ask. Don't just go posting this stuff. That's another important thing. Always ask if you can post it. Most places are really good, but they do ask that they get to see a copy of whatever you're posting, and they usually put a stamp or initial to show it's approved. Uh, we have gotten an awful lot of people out to our gaming events through coffee shops and the local university just by putting up signs there. Now, don't forget Board Game Geek or RPG Geek, depending on which type of gaming you're going for, or both. The Geek has a huge local community forum section with subcategories, subforums for pretty much every state and province. Now, the great part about using Board Game Geek is you know you're hitting your target market directly. There are local gamers here, and my own Windsor Gaming Resource wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Board Game Geek. That's where we got out people like Chris and Charles, who were the first people to come out to one of my first events ever. I met them through Board Game Geek. Gamers talking games. It's hard to go wrong. I also check for other local websites. Um, pretty much every city. Windsor's not that big. The fact that we have two really well-known independent websites that are, are news media, basically. One's called Ion Windsor. The other's windsorite.ca that are all about what's going on in Windsor. What are local events? What are local things you can go do? Often will let you freely advertise your events. You probably have some local equivalent to those. Now, I found these are great for getting out new people. Uh, especially if they're not at game stores. I found the combination of put, hosting your event at a coffee shop and getting on a site like windsright.ca gave us a huge boost of new members. And again, you need to know and understand your community to grow a new part of that community with your club, whether that's a city or even just a school. Yeah. Now, local radio stations will off, often promote free or nonprofit or charity events at no cost. Now, assuming your events are free, this is a great way to reach a bunch of people you probably wouldn't reach any other way. And don't forget about campus radio stations if you have a university in the area. Now, besides just advertising, you also need to communicate to local gamers why they should attend your event, rather than just playing games with a regular game group at home. Now, this could be a variety of things. Like, you could just be promoting the fact they're going to find new gamers to play with, or they're going to get to try out new games, or even get to try a game before they buy. Um, possibly even being able to play at a clean, well-lit space is enough of an advantage. You want to be able to show them that game night is something more than just playing games. Now, some gamers tend to prefer the familiar. They've been gaming for years at their own homes with their own friends, and it may take some effort to get them out. They won't just automatically flock to the siren call of games. Yeah, so this is the reason you may want to try to add some incentives to get people out. i host a giveaway. Have promo items to give out to attendees. Uh, for here, you're going to want to work with your venue. Maybe the venue will do something like offer a discount. 
Like for most of these, you want to work with publishers or your venue to see what they can offer. If they're game publishers, maybe they can get promo items of the games you're going to show off. If you've got a local game stores, maybe the game store will waive the tax during game night. Like one of the local stores gives out a gift certificate, the value of which is based on how many people attend the event. So if the atten event's lightly attended, they don't give out much. But if you get 100 gamers in their store, they give out a pretty hefty prize. Any of these can work to convince someone to attend an event they may have skipped otherwise. And also, don't give up. One or even two events that don't get the kind of traction you're hoping for is not the end. Look for feedback. Maybe there are time and date issues, conflicts you hadn't accounted for. <laughs> This is why you've got that social media presence we encourage you to get, to interact with people and to fine tune things. So there in general are some of my tips for launching a new game club and attempting to build your local gaming community. Now, I personally launched the Windsor Gaming Resource in 2002. That's a, I don't really consider it a club. It's, I don't even know what it is. It's just the name I used for a website years ago that grew into something bigger. Uh, this group is still going strong today. Building and maintaining the WGR has been one of the most rewarding experiences in my life. Now, I'll admit, it wasn't all sunshine and roses. There were rough spots, and sometimes it was a lot of work. But while running a local game club may not be for everyone, if you don't have anything like that in your community, I do strongly recommend you take the chance and try to something start something up yourself. Yep. So that uh, warps us. I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> so that wraps up our game club launch tips. <laughs> I have no idea why that got written that way. So the lobby and our chat room has been chatting a lot about uh, accessibility and yes. uh, fixing up that game. So real, it's really important when you're bringing games out into the public to make sure that for both accessibility and just for ease of setup and teardown that you've gone to the effort and made them, you know, set whether they're whether labels. Uh, someone was mentioning putting pictures of what's in them on the bottom of whatever it's you're call. doing things. Um, uh, Ryan is talking about uh, hand braille labeling things, which sounds painfully uh, labor intensive. But I, I just the the one um, braille label maker I found online was insanely expensive uh so uh, to be honest that's a great thing for accessibility if that's something mm -hmm. you can do that's probably worth doing and then let people know hey look we have done this if you have vision problems our game night is here to support you yeah absolutely um so, now I'll just add something. Now this isn't, I didn't cover this at all on the blog, but I get the idea Rob is also looking to somehow make money out of this. Don't look to me for that. I, I To me, you shouldn't be starting a club with the idea that is going to make you money or build your gaming library. You should be starting a club to build the local community and to get gamers to game with. Uh, we don't charge for any of our events. If you want to try that, if you think that's something you want to do, yes, I could see that if you are providing the game library, we have a local gamer that runs a tournament. And every year he charges people here in the tournament and he charges the event organizers to replace copies of his game because they're going to get used, which is fine. That's free. But that's, that's, that's his way to do it. I personally don't. Um, but it can be a valid way. If you want to charge everyone a buck an event or five bucks to come out, five bucks to be able to play games for four hours really isn't unreasonable. And then you can use that money to build your game library or to buy other things for the club. All I recommend is if you do that, watch your taxes. Uh, they're different in different countries. Once you start taking money for events like that, you are probably becoming a sole proprietorship of a small business, whether you realize it or not. And you better keep that money separate from the rest of your income. Uh, I know like the Toronto Area Board Game Society runs uh, major cons that helps yes. pay for their uh, their games and maintenance. Um, and even they're only charging like $5 a person. So they are not, you know, profiting. They are a non-profit organization mm -hmm. that manages a game club and a website or like a game library and a website. And that's about it. Um, yeah. and, and all their money, I think, is going into managing that uh, game library because again, as I was mentioning, their game library is really well maintained. Oh, it is. Um, it is very impressive. Between between little uh, uh, Tupperware type containers for all the the pieces and all the uh, game, you know, 
quick and easy setup guides and everything right inside the boxes. Uh, when you take one of their games out, it's really pleasurable to play. Yeah, they're definitely doing a better job than I've been doing here. Uh, well, again, they're also a significantly larger, you know, oh, yeah. body of people involved. Yeah, yeah, right? we, we tend to get out 30 people. They tend to get out 300 yeah, on a, exactly. a regular game night. So, and, and you're looking at a population base of 7 million yeah. versus, you know, 200,000. 200,000, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, again, wherever your community is, size your expectations for that. You yeah. know, you're not going to get the library of t tabs unless you've got a 7 million people community, yes. um, you may be starting off just at your local university. I mean, we, mm -hmm. Mo and I both got our starts at the University of Windsor Gaming Society. Um, that's yep. how things started. Now, they didn't have a game library. They were just giving us a space to play. But it was a gaming club. It was a community. And that's, that's how we got our real start in this gaming yep. uh, thing was through that university community. Yeah, I was 13 years old when I first joined that, so... Yeah, we weren't anywhere near university. We just no, nope. we just took part. Yep. So some of the stuff I saw in chat go by. I'm trying to think of what I saw. Make sure everyone can help clean up. Make sure everything's labeled. There was some good stuff. There was something earlier I missed it. Uh, Deanna's don't bring be outside beverages. Just don't assume. Ask any yeah. of this stuff. <laughs> like communicate. Be be adults. Yep. Yeah. Respect, respect for the place, respect for other people's games, respect, 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 yeah. and more respect. Really, that's it. <laughs> yeah, we talked about the downtown. There was something. I, I lost it. Yeah. There was something Ryan had said I wanted to go back to, but I, I don't remember where it is, so I apologize for that. So we will be hitting back in the chat if you have any other comments or questions on this topic. I think we covered most of it. Um, actually, I'm going to wait one second because it looks like Jeff's about to ask us something. Before we move on, do, 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 do. Of course, he's lagged, so. Yeah. I'm sure it doesn't look like it's that bad. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Yeah. So, welcoming people into the, mm. the gaming group. And we've talked about this in other episodes. Uh, but wherever you're set up, make sure someone is keeping an eye on the door. Yes. Uh, that, that's something we I didn't mention in here at all. Be a host. If you are organizing a club, whether it's you or not, like, again, I assume that you're being the alpha gamer, you're taking the lead, you're doing all these things yourself. Have someone play host. They may not get to play games that night, and that's okay. And if you are the host and you plan on playing games, sit down with people and let them know, hey, I'm hosting an event. I may have to get up and deal with people. Is that cool? So a perfect example of this. We're having a game night at easy mode last Saturday. I show up and Chad is there and he sets up underwater cities. I have to play this game. This game is supposed to be better than Terraforming Mars. I have heard this from multiple people. It is a better Terraforming Mars. I love Terraforming Mars. I got to play this game. I sit down. Chad starts teaching the rules. There's three of us there. That's it. A group of three gamers come in. I know they're gamers because they're holding a bunch of games. The games they are holding are Monopoly, Scrabble, Monopoly, Gamer, and Clue. And I'm like, ooh, okay then. So these are people who only know hobby board games. So I go over and I greet them. And I told Chad, I'm like, hey. So I go over and I greet them like, hey, how's it going? Here's where we have the games. They took a quick look at the games and were kind of intimidated. And they started setting up Scrabble. And I'm like, okay, you guys good? You're all right? Yeah, yeah, we're just going to play this. So I sat back down to play Underwater Cities. And Chad starts teaching. And then another gamer shows up, uh, Dave. And asked, Chad asked Dave, do you want to play this four-player game? He's like, yeah. So he starts reteaching the rules. I'm like, okay, wait, you're reteaching the rules. Forget it. I'm going to get up. And I went over and I brought Gokuku over to these brand new gamers. And here they're setting up Scrabble and they seem pretty happy with themselves. But I'm like, hey, you guys want to learn something new? Here, I'll show you something new. And they just like jumped. Like they were way happier than just playing Scrabble. So here I set it up and I'm teaching him Gokuku. It's a quick game, like 15 minute game, right? And I'm partway through and I look over and I notice my spots taken at Underwater Cities. Because another gamer had come in and Chad's like, hey, and I gave up my spot. I really wanted to play the game, but I was there to host this event. And yes, I didn't get to play Underwater Cities. I still really want to play Underwater Cities. But instead, I got three people who'd only ever played Monopoly and Clue to play Goo Cuckoo. And then later in the night, I got them to play Gizmos. And they came up to me and were like, where do we buy games like this? Right. That's that. That to me was the the shiny moment. I'm like, oh, that was fantastic. That was awesome. That's why I got to play host. 
But as soon as someone walks in the door, hey, how's it going? Are you here for the gaming event? Which I always have to ask because we don't tend to rent whole spaces because we're not big enough, right? Like the, the, our local group, while it has a lot of gamers, we don't get them all out at once. So we tend to be at a public space that is being used for whatever that public space is being used for in general. So make sure that it's important. Be a host, right? And check in with people. Like if you say hi. And when someone is done a game, this is something else. This is another tip for running a game night. This, this is probably something, a totally different topic. We could probably do a whole topic on running a game night where there should be some way to let people know when games are starting, when games are looking for players, and when people want to learn how to play a game. Whether that's signs, whether it's holding the game over your head. This is the thing I've now seen at multiple cons now, where if you're looking for gamers, you hold the game up and walk around the room. I hadn't seen that before, but I saw it at QCC, I saw it at Breakout, and I saw it at Origins. Um, what I do is yell loudly, as Deanna is just saying in the chat. I literally sit there, and three new gamers, is again, gamers showed up, not new gamers, new to me gamers. They brought Ascension and Cards Against Humanity. I encouraged them to play Ascension, not Cards Against Humanity. They set up Ascension, and they're like, do you want to play? And I'm like, I would love to, but I'm hosting. And I said, the problem is I might have to get up in the middle of the game. They're like, oh, I will, well, we, we really want to play. And I'm like, well, then I'm going to back off, because I might have to get up. And then I turned around, and I went, hey... Looking for players for Ascension, we'll sit too, right? Like, it's something I do. I have a nice, big, loud voice, so it works well. But it's definitely something you want. You want to do that. And when a group's wrapping up, encourage people to switch spots. So, like, if you got a table of four and a table of four, try to get it so two swap between them, right? So you kind of break up those groups and cliques and people who only play with their own home group. Try to get people to intermix and actually be social. That's why they're here at a club instead of gaming at home. Yep. So yeah, I know I went off on a little bit of a. Uh, <laughs> like I said we could totally do a whole episode yeah. on. Uh, well, we we kind of hosting a I mean, game we've, night. We've covered a lot of this sort of stuff, but so that's it for this week's Ask the Bell Up. If you'd like to read more gaming, gaming, uh, game, gaming, and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see plenty of topics answered in blog form. Uh, if you got a question for us, remember. Go to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. I kind of want to go into the show notes and every week add another something <laughs> in there, so it just keeps getting longer. Uh, sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox once a week, but not today. I will be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage where you can find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. How did I forget to send out a newsletter? I was like bored because I did the show notes ahead of time. I'm like, I got lots of time. I'm going to write a review. I totally missed the show notes or the, that's all right. They can go out tomorrow, but still feel bad about that. <laughs> you don't want to read the audio by getting up here. Once, once we're done this section. All right. So last week, I talked about a giveaway coming up. Uh, we're going to offer up a copy of Zentico to one of you awesome gamers anywhere in the world. Uh, we're still working on the specifics, though. I plan to launch the giveaway in concert with a full review. Uh, I wrote a different review instead of that one so far because I really want to talk about Goku some more. So I got a little ahead of myself on that one. But we're going to get that out um, soon. Keep paying attention. All right, so stay tuned here and watch for announcement on social media for that to go live. The unboxing's out for that already, right? Yeah, it is. So yeah. I don't know. I just I have to sit down and write it and plan it. It's coming. It's coming. Just a quick road to extra life announcement. Our first planning meeting is set for Sunday, July 28th. So those of you listening to the podcast, you missed it. Uh, but we are going to have it at Easy Mode Esports Lounge, uh, which is the place where we've been having our new monthly gaming events. The goal of this initial meeting is to lay out the roadmap for coming months, as well as to find volunteers to help us promote the event, run and organize event upcoming Extra Life gaming events. So if you're local... <laughs> and interested in helping us with one of our biggest <laughs> events of the year, which supports a fantastic cause, the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals, we'd love to see you out Sunday. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the table? 
Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. Now, I got quite a few games to talk about this week, so this is going to be a little bit of a longer one. Um, Two of these, though, are big. Two new-to-me games that hit the table, uh, and I'm going to lead off with one of those. Uh, The first game I'm really excited to be able to actually talk about is Talisman Legendary Tales from Pegasus Spear. Now, I think everyone listening should know, though I, I think I mentioned it before, maybe I'm wrong, that I am a huge Games Workshop Talisman fan and have been since the 90s and possibly the 80s. I can't quite remember when that came out. Like, Talisman was one of those formative games for me. It is one of the ones I grew up grew up with. And I got to say, if it wasn't for buying White Dwarf 100, which led me to buying Talisman 2nd Edition, I probably wouldn't be the hobby gamer I am now. So needless to say, I was very excited when I saw that Pegasus Spiel came out with a talisman game, a modern new talisman game. And this one was different because it's a lighter family version. Uh, This is Talisman Legendary Tales. And I know myself and others have been eager to hear your take on this one and how it sizes up compared to the fond memories you have. Yeah. I had a lot of fun memories. So earlier this year at Origins, I spent a significant amount of time at the Pegasus Spiel booth um, and took some, uh, I don't know, I had to make some personality checks, like whatever. I, bluff's not the right word because I wasn't lying. Um, I, I had to make some con checks because this took some work to convince them to give me a review copy of Legendary Tales. Because I'll admit, I wasn't going to rush out and buy this because it looks quite different from the original. But they were cool enough to do it after a bit of convincing and shaking of hands and promises I had to make to email them with every bit of content I've ever put out about their game, which they're going to get a link to this podcast when it goes live because I'm a man of my word. Uh, What was cool, though, is after I made the convincing, they actually threw in a promo, the Druid character, so that was kind of neat. So I finally did get to check the game out with my wife and kids last week. So... Very much more family and, uh, sorry, we've also got an unboxing video that's about ready to go live. Watch for that to show up on YouTube on a coming Monday. Yeah, so one thing to note, right from the beginning, we played once. So this isn't necessarily my definitive review. This is everything you want to know about Talisman, Legendary Tales. I've only played once. I I got to say I'm still experiencing the game. Now, I got to say, right from the start, this game is very different from its namesake. Uh, While the game is set in the same universe, uh, because there's an intro story that talks all about the Crown of Command and using the Crown of Command to take over the kingdom and how you need talismans to get through the portal of power to get the Crown of Command, this all sounds right from Talisman, uh, it just doesn't have that Warhammer look. Because despite the fact Talisman never said It was set in the Warhammer world. It was very much set in the Warhammer world. Uh, Just the character classes that were available, the different races, the things you would experience. Uh, To me, this is much more bright and happy looking than the grim dark setting I'm used to. Now, I guess I get it. It's a kid's game, so that kind of makes sense. And yes, you are trying to get talismans, so you have that tie-in. The other big difference, too, though, is that now a cooperative game. So very much more family and youth oriented than earlier Warhammer offerings. Yeah, definitely. I'll admit I was a kid when I played the original, but this is definitely family, like younger kids. Now the game includes five scenarios. Uh, You are supposed to play these in order. Uh, At this point, we've only played scenario one. Uh, You set up a modular board, these hex boards, and then depending on the scenario you're on, you're going to put tokens out on some of the spots on the board. Uh, You're going to pick characters. Uh, This is kind of neat because when you pick a character, you grab a bag and it has a little bag tag on it showing the character. Uh, We went with the troll, the druid, which again was a promo, the elf and the warrior. Uh, In your bag are a bunch of chits and the chits have different symbols on them. The other thing that's in the bag are standees. And one cool thing, so here's a big thumbs up. The Pegasus Spiel is there is a male and female version of every character. I thought that was rather nice to see. So you're going to pick out whichever character you want to play. The the character sheets are two-sided. Your chits have symbols on them. So there's a sword. There's like a magician's hat, like a pointy hat. There's a bag. And there's time. And then there's sometimes some extras that are a combination of those. So like the warrior had a sword with a... 
a symbol that means draw another token. Um, my troll had one that had two swords on it, but it's a mix of those. They each determine what you do on your turn, which is kind of neat. Now, there's also a D6 with one to four on it, plus a four with an hourglass on it, and then the sixth side has a portal on it. So it's certainly a tight little package to work with. Nothing too complex. This game is showing yeah. a weight of 1.1 on Board Game Geek. So be aware of what you're, uh, what we're talking about here. Yeah, this is a light family weight game. This is this is no big adventure game or dungeon crawl or anything where you're going to level up your characters. So one of the things that's a carryover from the original is this is a slightly roll and move game. You're going to roll your die to move, and then you're going to move to a tile, and then you're going to encounter any tokens that are on the tile. So again, slightly similar to the original, because in the original you would draw an adventure card. Um, in this particular scenario, we're moving around looking for tokens with herbs on them. And tokens that weren't herbs were tended to be baddies to fight. Now this part's actually cool. I, I do like this mechanism, just because I've never seen it before. So when you flip a baddie over, they're going to have symbols on them. And they're going to have those sword or those magic hat symbols. And those are the symbols you need to draw from your bag to defeat those bad guys. So what you do is you things from your bag. And then you look at them and see if you can defeat things. So swords fight swords, magic fights magic. So I don't know why they didn't call it um, the terms from the original game, which was, oh man, I'm, wow, I'm forgetting the name of the stupid, it's, <laughs> it's not mana. Wow, it's terrible. I played Talisman more than any other game in my collection. And I can't remember what the magic called. It's the blue tokens, not the red ones. Whatever, the magic, they, they called it magic. So you're going to... Draw your tokens. Now, the neat one is if you draw the little baggie. And what the baggie means is it's cooperate with another character. So you pick another character and you get the pull from their bag, which I thought was really neat. So because everyone's bag was slightly different. So my troll had more swords in it because I was a strength based character, whereas Big G was playing the warrior. She had a bunch of symbols where if she drew a sword, she could draw another token. So that was pretty cool, too. So I was neat. And then if you match the bad guys, you kill them, and then you get to draw a token from the treasure bag. And when you draw a token from the treasure bag, it has more of these symbols on them, but you decide collectively who gets the token. So I thought that was pretty neat. It's definitely unique. Now, this is not going to challenge your average adult gamer, though. No. Like I said, family weight. Very, very family weight. Uh, which leads me to the next thing, which I totally was not expecting from any board game I ever owned. Um, and that is an I Spy or Where's Waldo or I don't know what you call it, finding things aspect. So we got about halfway through the mission, right? And there's a story where you read off a board and we had to replenish the board. We had to reseed it with new tokens. And what it was was put two tokens on every tile that has a fairy on it. So you literally had to look at the tiles for this little tiny fairy symbol. And I got to say, the kids did have a lot of fun with this, but then I screwed up and I counted the tokens wrong. So we spent way too much time looking for a fourth tile with fairies on it that didn't exist. So that was my bad. Um, it was bad enough. I should have realized when I Googled it that no one else seemed to have this problem that I probably counted the tokens wrong and it's not that we couldn't find a fairy. So it was really cool. But the fact that I screwed up made it a little, it didn't go over as well as it should have with the family. Cause it went from, this is awesome to this is frustrating, but that's my bad. Not Pegasus Spiel's fault. Um, but I gotta say, I have definitely never seen I spy mixed into a hobby board game. That that's a new one to me. Uh, overall, I gotta say it was pretty neat. Uh, it's not really all that talisman like. Uh, yeah, I guess we we're collecting a talisman, but it could have been anything. Uh, it's I, like if all your comparisons are is you're going to flip to see an encounter and roll a move, that counts for hundreds of games, not just talisman. Uh, but I did enjoy it. More importantly, though, my kids really liked it. Uh, we did finish mission one. We're going to move on to mission two. And you can look forward to hearing more about talisman legendary tales once we play more. Now, this is getting a ton of positive response as a family game. I saw a lot of great comments indicating that like with the number of plays you're going to get out of this with your family, it's only about $4 per play, you know, so wow. it's, it's a great family fun game as well. Uh, and again, it's just as long as you set your expectations correctly, family game, great for the kids, uh, like six and up, I think, or something like that. And you're golden. But you know, as Angie Games, who is a heavier gamer, is a little more disappointed uh, she's pointing out that its ties to talisman are weak at best 
and mm-hmm. uh, she didn't like the Where's Waldo aspect. So I think the Where's Waldo aspect would have went better if we hadn't screwed it up. If we had found them right away and went, we're done and just moved on, it might have went well. It does look like this is going to continue, the Where's Waldo, because we noticed while we were looking for fairies that there were mushrooms on some tiles and bones on some tiles and bats on some tiles. So it's definitely a thing. Now, the one thing I hadn't mentioned, the problem, too, with that is I have a big game table. And there's stuff on these tiles, like your standees and your chits, and like it's not easy to see. And most of it had us picking up the tiles to look at them, and that kind of disrupted the board. Whereas if you were smaller, playing on a smaller table, it might have been a bit better. But it is kind of silly to make people look for things on a randomized board. Well, not randomized, but a, a, a modular board that's currently being used. It's kind of an odd choice. So up next for me... Last week is our second game night at Easy Mode. So I already kind of mentioned this when we were talking about uh, hosting game nights because I talked about one of the things that, hap- that happened already. But this place has been awesome so far. Uh, they actually went out and bought more tables just for us to host tabletop game events there. They bought more chairs. They bought more uh, low tables. So here's another thing Easy Mode that does I, I hadn't even mentioned before. They have their big gaming tables. They also have these low tables to put your drinks on. So the drinks are not sitting where the games are. Fantastic. Um, they had better lighting this time. And thankfully, the AC was working. Uh, they even added more food options. And I got to say, I this place has been fantastic so far. We've only been there twice, but really impressed. You know, and this is what we talked about earlier with respecting your venue. The group made purchases and brought new customers into the venue. And as a result, the venue has made it even better for the gamers. Yeah. Now, one of the things that's been great about the new venue is we're getting more than just our regulars, right? I've been running events in Windsor for a long time. At this point, it almost feels like I've reached everyone. Oh, hell no. We are still getting new people out. This past week, we had two sets of three people show up who I've never seen before, which is awesome. Now, one group was an experienced gamer who went off and did their own thing. I mentioned them earlier playing Ascension. The other group, though, I kind of took under my wing and showed them some hobby board games. Now, they showed up with stuff like Monopoly Gamer and Scrabble and had never experienced anything other than mass market games. Yeah. So this is why you should have some gateway games with you at all times. <laughs> yeah. So first up, I taught them Go to go Cuckoo. That went over really well. This game always goes over really well. I've yet to have it fail. Um, I don't think you need to know more about Go Cuckoo. I'm going to have a review up uh, tomorrow. So you'll be able to see that on the blog. I'm sure we'll be talking about it a bit next week. Then up next, I taught them Gizmos. Now this one, I admit, I was a little worried. Because this group has literally zero hobby gaming experience. All they know is roll and move max markets. And I'm pleased to say that that worry was unfounded. Gizmos actually worked out to be a perfect gateway game for them. Well, it did take a bit for them to grasp some of the concepts. By the end, all three of them were remarking how unique the game was and how much fun it was to play. Like they were even asking where they could get a copy, and I pointed them towards a local game store. So this is something important to note. There are probably many ways to get the game cheaper, and the bellhop can hook you up with most of them. <laughs> but these were new gamers, and that's a big difference. While your experienced gamer has a huge, probably got a huge library and a budget and are fully aware of all the various ways to get games, a newer gamer needs to be brought into that community. Mm-hmm. And getting them into the FLGS is an important first step in introducing them to the gaming community. Yeah, as well, I hadn't mentioned it, but we I also pointed out other events we have at other places in the city at the same time. Now, the other big game for me at Easy Mode, though, was I finally got to play Dead Man's Cabal from Pandasaurus. My God, this game has some of the best production quality I have seen. Like, Pandasaurus just keeps knocking it out of the park. Ever since Wasteland Express, like, that that game just is amazing production quality. Dead Man Cabal doesn't quite get up to that level, but man, it's close. Uh, beautiful art, really unique theme, nice thick boards, actual little plastic femurs and skulls, and uh, the big horn skull to go on the thing. Uh, just amazing components. Now, the theme is pretty out there. Uh, You are a necromancer, and you want to have a party, but you don't really have any friends. So you get a hold of your other necromancers that are part of your cabal, because, well, I don't know who else to get. And you decide to get together and throw a party, but you need guests, so you start resurrecting them from the dead. Well, not your average kid-friendly game. Parents, (laughs) don't encourage your kids to grow up reading the Necronomicon. Let them find it on their own. 
<laughs> I gotta say, it, this I, it's 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 more kid friendly than Sorcerer was art wise. This is more of an amusing take on it. But you are handling little skulls and femurs, so I can kind of get it. And it is all about witchcraft. So. This game uses a really unique action selection system I've never seen before. You start off with a grid four by three, and it has randomly drawn skulls of four different colors. There's red ones, white ones, black ones, and gold ones. And they're put out randomly at the start of the game. You then draw from a bag another random skull, and it'll be one of those four colors. You then put it on this thing, and you bump the row down. So whatever row you put it in, you slide all the you slide one skull off the end. That skull that comes off the end, you put in your personal supply. Then you look at all the skulls in your personal supply and pick one and do the action associated to it. Then you do that, and that's called your private action. Only you get to do that because you're the one that bumped the skull. Then you go back to that same grid, and you look at the middle column. It's like one that's lighter colored, and you look at the most common color of skull, and then everyone gets to do that action. It's really different, and... Man, I liked it. It was very unique. I, again, I like games that do something unique, right? And this did something I've never seen before. It was really cool. And having the whole two actions, you get a private and then a public, and they could be the same one was really neat. There's a little bit more to it. Like the horn skull tells you certain actions can't do different turns, but very, really unique way of determining. And the other thing is like the skulls you bump, you don't have to do the color you bump. The fact you can build up an... Uh, inventory of skulls ahead of time to prepare your actions ahead like there, there was a lot going on to think about with this mechanic yeah so it's it's an action programming variable phase order mechanic Is yeah that, I, that works that's that's the description that uh, the board game geek has gone with I, I guess when they were categorizing to do it. it it's definitely action select action programming i guess because you're programming the public action to happen after your public because there's actually definitely action selection as well because you are selecting your right. own personal action. And you pretty much are going to have an option of all four. But that private, sorry, your private action, your public action is definitely programmed. So yeah, I can see it. Variable phase order, yeah, because you don't know what order they're going to happen. I get it. So the four actions, um, I they're named weird things like the scriptorum, the arboretum, or something like that, whatever. Um, one is collect more skulls. Uh, another is collecting runes. Another is collecting ritual cards. And the last one is going to the sanctuary. I remember the name of that one to actually perform rituals. Now, rituals are represented by cards and you require a certain pattern of skulls to be on the sanctuary. And it looks like, you know, like a, a bunch. Of, it's not a pentagram, but it's a whole bunch of cross lines. And you have to make sure the skulls are in a certain order that you can trace a pattern to put the card into play. Now, the cards, the rituals are your guests that you're resurrecting. Now, when you resurrect someone, those runes you collected from the other action, you can then play any matching runes. Now, this is the part I'm not even going to try to explain well here, but you then get to play a weird area majority micro game at the Oracle for every ritual uh, token you match. Ritual is the wrong word. Runes, whenever runes, whatever runes you match, you get to play this thing. So the Oracle drives endgame scoring, and it's this weird little micro game of area control for endgame scoring. Uh, at this point, I've only played once. This is another one I plan on doing up a full review when I can get more plays in, so I'm not going to get into more detail now, but at this point, I will say this is one of the more unique games i played recently. I don't any own anything else like it, and to me, that's always a good thing. Yeah, and we've heard it before. While I tend to stay in my lane a little bit more, I'm always, <laughs> always eager to find that next totally new concept in a game. Yeah, totally agree. Now, for my final game of the week, uh, I'll take you to this past Sunday where something magical happened. My mom was out of town visiting her brother, and we were able to get a sitter for the kids. This meant my wife and I had the house to ourselves. Uh, to celebrate, we made a nice dinner for the two of us, and after that, we headed out to our local brewery, one we hadn't been before, the Sandwich Brewing Company. There, we had some really good craft beer. Uh, they make six different brews, and literally all of them were good, which was impressive. And then we played, if, or as we were drinking, we played a few rounds of the Duke. Yeah. It, it's always a solid game. It's one of the games that I went out and bought almost immediately after playing the copy of it down at your place. Yeah. Uh, both my wife and I have loved the Duke since we discovered it back in 2013. Uh, I think we've mentioned on the show before, it is a chess-like abstract strategy game played on a 6x6 six six grid. Goal is to capture the opponent's Duke using your units. Your units are two-sided tiles. Each not only shows how the units move, 
so you don't have to memorize how things move. Uh, they also have different moves on the back than the front, and every time you move, you flip the tile. Really brilliant game. Uh, every turn, you're either putting new tiles on the board or moving one that's on the board. I have loved the Duke for a real long time. Yeah, and even if you start to get a little bored with it, there are expansions that can add a little spice to it. That's true. We have a pile of them, and we almost never touch any of them because we have enough time, fun with the original. Because like I said, we played three games on Sunday, and it's as good now as it was the first time we played it. Like, to me, this is a must-own two-player game. It's Because one of the best aspects of this game is how little table space it picks up. So this is why I dig having it in like on the car or available, because when we go to a place like a brew pub, a bar, or a restaurant, this fits really well on a small table. Uh, this is one game that my wife and I bring out pretty much every date night. So, uh, what have you got planned for the coming week? So the big thing going on is this Saturday... Oh, I forget the name off the top of my head, and I know Tech in the chat can correct me. Rich, the designer of Quad Heroes, who lives up in Ottawa, is coming down to Windsor to the CG Realm to do a launch party for his game Quad Heroes. Ryan Iller. Which, Ryan Iller, thank you. Really unique looking game where your playing pieces are cubes, so basically dice. I don't know if he minds if I call them dice. And each side has an action on it. And what happens is you tumble the dice. And the direction you tumble the dice is the action you take. That just sounds really cool to me. Again, I like games that do something different. This sounds different to me. Um, it's also going to be our regular game night at CG Realm. So I'm going to bring Dead Man's Cabal because I want to play it again. But I'm really looking forward to trying out Quad Heroes uh, plus meeting Ryan, which is just kind of cool. It's it's awesome that we actually have a de designer coming down to show off his game. I just think that's really neat. So those are the big things. Um, other than that, we do have our extra life planning meeting on Sunday. So I'm looking forward to finalizing some of the plans we talked about earlier. All right, and uh, mostly we were just sort of chatting about uh, talisman and memories in the uh, lobby. Uh, some fond and, and less fond memories and, and less than fond replays. It doesn't necessarily age as well as we all remember it uh, doing. Uh, Jeff is asking uh, that at some point you should compare the Duke to Onitama. Uh, Onitama is much simpler and over too quickly. Uh, only time you're going to have fun with for quite a few plays. It's a good game, but it just, it tends to play the same eventually. Like it just keeps going the same after every game. They're the very similar feel. Whereas the Duke I find has more replayability. I do still dig Onitama, but I had fun with it. So we had like a progression, right? It was Hive. We loved Hive and we played the heck out of Hive. Uh, then we found the Duke. We're like, oh my God, the Duke. And then we found Onitama and we're like, ooh, oh my God, Onitama. But we moved away from that one quicker. But then we were distracted by Patchwork. Patchwork I still love, but it takes up a lot of table space. From Patchwork, we moved back to Onitama a bit, but then we got back to the Duke. And the Duke, out of all of them, is the one we've enjoyed the most. Now, what Deanna is noting in the chat is a good point. Onitama is great for at the beach, right? Like, you're not going to break out the Duke with its board and everything. Onitama is a neoprene mat, nice solid pieces, and if you laminate the cards, it's now waterproof. So it's more of an outdoor game. Uh, the Duke is more of a sit at a coffee shop, sit at a bar, and play. And uh, Tech corrected me. It's Ryan Eiler, not Iller. Eiler. Eiler. Ryan, I apologize, Ryan. Uh, and yes, so, so uh, the Duke is out of print. You do need to grab the version I got, which is the Lord's Edition. Yep. Yeah. Now. A quick shout out and a thank you to some of our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Uh, Andrew Dacey, thank you. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark, join Phil, Chris, Bob every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. Roger Malosh, thank you. Roger Lynn Scott Jr., thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. 
drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers in YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights, 8.30. We play mostly Gloomhaven, but now and then we'll surprise you with something else. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.